Hi everyone, thank you for joining us and uh, welcome to this uh, Altmetric webinar on gender diversity and Altmetrics. Just to introduce our speakers for today, uh, my name's Josh, I'm the Marketing Manager at Altmetric and I'm joined by Dr. Zoo Suze Kundu, who's the Head of Public Engagement at Digital Science and Mike Taylor, Head of Metrics Development at Digital Science. So uh, just to go over what we're covering today, uh, we're just going to go over a little bit of housekeeping just to make sure everyone has the best webinar experience they can. Then I'll be handing over to Mike, who's going to talk about the science of the science of sexual harassment and Me Too. Then Suze will be taking us through gender and the Altmetric Top 100 2019. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A. So just a bit of housekeeping here, uh, we are recording. Um, so if you do need to go off and uh, attend to something else, uh, you will receive a link to the recording, uh, hopefully tomorrow. And we'll be posting that on our Figshare and YouTube channels, the Altmetric Figshare and YouTube channels. All attendees are currently muted. If you do have any technical issues, please send the host a private chat message, just in case you can't see our slides or you can't hear us for any reasons. Uh, if you do have any questions, please type them into the questions box, which should be on your GoToWebinar little panel there. Uh, we'll try to get to those at the end and get through as many as we can. So as, as we go through the, the webinar, please do type them in as you think of them. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mike to take us through the science of the science of sexual harassment and Me Too. Hi, everyone. So my name is Mike Taylor, Head of Metrics Development of Digital Science. I mostly work on digital on uh, dimensions and on Altmetric. My details, if you want to get hold of me, I'm Harrison on Twitter, and that's my ORCID details if you want to have a look at any of my publications or presentations. So this work emerged from a piece of analysis that I was doing with a publisher who was interested in looking at um, some books or potential books that were in the in the fields of applied feminist philosophy and following on from that uh, from the work that i was doing with her i went away and i started doing some some searches in dimensions on on, on sexual harassment and after a little while looking at the data i combined that with the the me too um, hashtag as had emerged in october 2017 and the data that i saw was really quite extraordinary so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through some data about the, the research in, in sexual harassment and Me Too, and also looking at some Google trends. Generally speaking, my methodology in this approach is to use dimensions to search for sexual harassment or Me Too. You can do that on the free version. If you are logged in, then you can um, export those uh, search results. I think about a thousand records. And if you are a, an Altmetric um, customer, then you can pass them through from Dimensions through to Altmetric if you're a subscriber of both platforms. However, for the, for the purposes of today, I'm just gonna be showing you those results and talking you through about some of the observations that I made. Sorry, I'm using a trackpad that I'm not used to using, but there we go. Right, okay, so um, a little snapshot. So you go to Dimensions, you do this search, and you get a number of results out. This is just a screen grab of a few of those, a few of those top articles, a few of the most recent articles. It gives you a quite a nice introduction into, into the subtopics that are occurring when you do it, when you're surfacing, when you're doing a search on Dimensions. And there are some really interesting individual pieces of research there. But first of all, I wanted to have a look at um, some of the Google search trends. So if here we've gone to trends.google.com and I've done a search for sexual harassment, comma, me too, and you get the results there in the blue and the red lines. So important to note, these are the worldwide figures. What Google gives you when you use trends.google.com isn't um, a volume, an absolute number of searches, but rather it's a relative volume. So it's relative to 100, and it gives you an indication of the balance of searches when comparing these two terms. So the red line is the Me Too, the volume of Me Too searches. And you can clearly see the effect of the Weinstein um, scandal in October 2017. So the search, 
the, the term Me Too had originated about 10 years before, but as you can see, hadn't really been, hadn't gone viral in any meaningful sense until it was used in connection with, with Harvey Weinstein. October 2017. And you see there that massive peak of volume, very tightly focused in on just on that one short period. Looking at the effect that that had on global searches for sexual harassment, I think is really interesting because although I'm not going to claim that there is any kind of causative relationship between these two things, I haven't done the, search, I haven't done the research to back that up, it certainly suggests that there is something here to be looking at. It suggests there is the indication that people talking about, being able to talk about sexual harassment using the Me Too hashtag enabled them to start thinking about sexual harassment and going to going, thinking more directly about the, the, the problem rather than just the viral, um, uh, viral uh, topic. The search, the volume on sexual harassment traffic globally has always exceeded Me Too. You can see, uh, you can see how the two things have tracked over time. But there's a really interesting thing that occurs in about, I think it's December or January, December 2018 or January 2019, somewhere around that period. I was rather struck by this data because I couldn't figure out what it was just by looking at it. If you look at the USA or you look at the UK, that red spike doesn't exist, right? I mean, you've got a much smaller peak now just looking at the USA for the volume of searches on Me Too twice the number of volumes for, for sexual harassment. That relationship between the two figures continues to suggest itself, possibly suggesting itself a little bit more clearly. There's a secondary peak um, in, I think it was December 2018. I think that was associated with discussions about the Oscars. But where's that big red peak gone to? Well, it turns out that big red peak came from India. Um, there was a, a, an independent uh, Indian Me Too phenomena happened um, focusing around allegations in, in Bollywood. But what's really interesting to me is that when we look at that, all we see is that one spike. There's almost no relationship between searches for sexual harassment and Me Too. That Me Too phenomena grows and it dies and it's gone away. It doesn't carry on going. It doesn't trigger the same kind of conversations about sexual harassment or at least the same kind of searches on sexual harassment as we've seen in the USA and in the UK and, and in other countries. It suggests that although we often think of Me Too as being a global phenomena, it's actually not a global phenomena. It was something which caught people's attention in India, but that hasn't provoked any kind of um, discussion or change in um, the way that people are using Google to, to um, research ideas around sexual harassment. So that's, that's it for Google. Let's think about that research. So I've gone to Dimensions. We've indexed over 100 million articles there on a search for sexual harassment and Me Too. So the data that we're going to be looking at now is volumes of conversations, links, citations, outputs, and so on about the research. So these are people in universities who are doing research, writing books, writing research articles, reviews, and so on, that answer to the subject or address the subject of sexual harassment or Me Too. So, as I just figured my way through the, there we go, right. So I pass through the, um, the search results from Dimensions into Altmetric, and these are some of the top articles that are being um, that are being surfaced. And again, I would just like to call your attention to some of the subjects that are being discussed. These are extremely important pieces of research. You know, these are not at all trivial. They're being published in the top journals, um, and they are in many different subject areas. So we've got physics here, we've got um, general science, we've got medicine and so on. This is a subject area which has found resonance outside of the, the rather narrow focus of um, area of feminist philosophy or feminist studies, which is typically where these conversations have been found up to the Me Too moment. So if you look at Twitter, so these are tweets that are that Altmetric is reporting that are linking to research that is either addressing social um, sexual harassment or Me Too. So I, I just want to discuss this very briefly. So looking at that, in the middle of that uh, report, Twitter volume, we've got here a peak in October 2017. So this, these are people who are tweeting about research that has already been published before. 
because obviously the Me Too phenomena happens in October 2017. There's no literature that mentions Me Too before 2017. But immediately the Weinstein happens, the Weinstein uh, scandal happens, we suddenly have massively increased volumes on Twitter of people sharing, talking about, discussing, linking to papers about sexual harassment, about academic, serious academic work in this field. When we look at blogs, we get a slightly different picture. So I just want to take you back there. So that's Twitter. And that conversation seems to be starting, really kicking off on Twitter in, in October 2017. Let's look at the blogs again, orange lines. Although there is an increase at about October 2017 on the number of blogs that are posting about research and sexual harassment, it's been ongoing. Now, I have happened to have shown you the same scale for both Twitter and news and blogs for convenience sake. But I could have zoomed out on this a little bit and you could have seen that actually the volume of blogs that were discussing sexual harassment had been growing for about three to four years preceding the Weinstein, uh, Weinstein scandal. So what we've got here is evidence that actually the, the conversations, the people talking about discussing research in the area of sexual harassment has been building in the years preceding, uh, preceding uh, October 2017. And the same is also true for news to a lesser extent. You can still see the big peak in October 2017 there. Um, but proceeding, there is a reasonable volume of news stories that are covering research. So again, just to just to um, just to address this, this isn't newspaper stories about sexual harassment. These are newspaper stories that are linking to research about it. So this is very mainstream coverage of academic research in the mainstream media or in the blogs or on Twitter. So again, it's quite interesting to see that, that actually this area was getting a reasonable amount of coverage already. So I want to talk a little bit about how the academic world responded to the Me Too crisis and how that's been reflected in some of the data. So we're going from altmetric, going back to dimensions. This is just a graph that I've cut and pasted. So I've gone to dimensions. You can do this free version app.dimensions.ai, sexual harassment in quote marks or me too, you'll get the same graph. So what we see here then are a couple of interesting phenomena. First of all, the year from 2014 to 2017 shows a steady state growth. We've got a reasonable amount of growth going from about 200 articles in 2014 to something like 350 articles published in 2017. And then Weinstein happens in 2017 and the response is, is pretty straightforward. I mean, you can see that we have gone from there being 350 articles in 2017 to there being about 1,000 articles in 2019. Now, we often think about academia responding quite slowly to crises. Well, that's actually not true. And whenever I've done analyses like this, you can see academia responding incredibly quickly. This is a phenomenal response to a viral study. And this is, as we've seen before, as we've seen in some of those papers that I showed you before, this is really important academic work that's coming out. This isn't, um, isn't trivial in any sense at all, really important work. If we exclude Me Too, so if we again go to dimensions, we type sexual harassment, not Me Too. So in this case, we are getting um, search results for papers on sexual harassment that explicitly do not use the, the word Me Too in either the title or the abstract. We've got three different trends going on here. So preceding 2014, we've got this slow steady state growth. Then we've got three years of slightly accelerated growth going up to 2017 when Me Too happens. And then finally, post Me Too, we have this incredibly steep um, growth in, in research. So again, you know, just to iterate, these are not people who are discussing the Me Too phenomena in any viral, in, in, in the, the virality of that particular expression. They're looking at the study of sexual harassment and that, that's, that's an incontrovertible observation. Books show a similar um, similar growth. I my background is in in book publishing, um, and one of the things about books is that they can be quite slow to respond. I mean, it takes a good year to develop a book, but just think about how how quickly this has responded. And we've gone from there being thirty or forty books published a year in the area of sexual harassment to being over one hundred and twenty in the last year. I mean, again, you know, we think about the speed of academia, we think about the speed of publishing. These are not things that are known, or book publishing, I should say, 
These are not things which are known to be fast. But here we are, you know, this this is the equivalent of a handbrake turn. This is this is screeching tires, this is enormously exciting if you're a if you're a, a data person like me. Proceedings, conferences, they do respond a little bit more quickly. And I think again we can see that in the in the data. But again, I just want to call your attention to this, because this is really interesting stuff. Up until 2014, this was quite a flat area. In the three years preceding Weinstein, we see growth. We absolutely see growth happening. And then, you know, it really kicks off. So approaching the end of um, end of some of my slides here, um, this is probably the heart of the matter. So this is data coming from dimensions. This isn't in the free version, so um, I'm apologies for that. But this shows you the amount of, sorry, the number of grants that are supporting academics working in this area. This is also really interesting. So if you look at that level, so we've got a blue line there for active grants, because grants last for multiple years, obviously. Green for um, starting grants, just to give you a little indication of why there are two lines there. If anything, there is a drop in the number of active grants, a very marginal drop. And again, if I'd shown you um, um, a, a broader time scale, you'd have seen a drop, a small drop in the number of grants. So in this case, that drop is happening until 2016. There are a small decrease year on year over the course of 10 years of the number of academics who are receiving funding to do work in sexual harassment. And then Weinstein happens, 2017, and immediately the funders start kicking in. 2017, 2018, 2019, we see a rapid amount of growth. We go from the number of active grants in this area, going from about 30 to well over 100. Now, I did a presentation on this in Canada last year, and I likened it to the world going from a small workshop with perhaps 30 or 40 academics to a conference with perhaps 200 people. We look at that graph there and we have to think about the number of people who are doing um, postdoctoral work in this area, PhDs in this area, people who are making it their careers work. This is an extremely important trend. This uh, suggests that there is going to be significant, um, significant amounts of work being published in the years to come. We're only going to see these, gra these graphs going up. It's a really interesting and uh, um, exciting area for, for people to be to be working in. And also it's interdisciplinary. As I said earlier, there are people who are working in physics, town planning even. I mean, one of those papers um, that I showed you from the dimensions is about town planning and sexual harassment. Now, this is a field which goes absolutely to the heart of human society. And it may not be a global phenomenon yet, but it is certainly looking as, as if it's going to be going that way. But we can think about social um, social uh, um, impact by looking at policies. So going back to altmetric and looking at just looking at policy documents here. And here we have people who are um, people like the World Health Organization and uh, various governments, the European Commission, writing papers, reports, grey literature which again is citing academic literature. So the, gra the, the, the um, bars that you're looking at there are representing the number of citations that are going to this literature, the, the literature about sexual harassment and Me Too. Now policies are really interesting because typically they are very, very slow. Um, I'm just in the throes of writing a paper looking at the uh, um, altmetrics of documents that are 10 years old. And you can see there that Policy documents take, you know, they can take easily take seven to eight to nine, ten years to um, be citing academic material. And actually, it's one of those things that I think people in, in research communications get really interested about because that is quite a slow um, migration, if you like, from universities through to policy thinking. You know, and if anybody out there has got any good ideas about how we can speed the, uh, that up, I think you're onto a, onto a winner there. But nevertheless, you do see speed um, occurring occasionally. And although the, uh, the, the rate of increase of policy citations on sexual harassment post Weinstein is not as obvious as it is in say Twitter or, or, or Google, um, nevertheless, I think that uh, 
it would be a reasonable uh, takeaway from this graph to say that there was an increase in the number of, of bars and probably an increase in the height of those bars as well. So there does appear to be a growing interest amongst the, uh, the people, the authors of, of grey literature um, in, in citing research in this space. Some of those policy bodies that do write these, um, it's important to point out again, you know, these are august, important, um, influential organisations who are writing reports. Those reports are being written with the intention of affecting policy change. Um, again, you know, this isn't just some kind of Google search. This is evidence. I believe it to be evidence of actual social impact. The papers that they're producing, the reports they're writing that is, um, are um, addressing issues of sexual approach. Again, you know, we've got agriculture here, we've got um, banking, we've got science. You know, again, just to reinforce, this is a field of research which is highly interdisciplinary, which is highly impactful, and um, is um, is evidence of uh, really first-class uh, um, social impact. So I wanted to just go through a few conclusions on my final slide here. Um, so one of the areas is to think about is there is some evidence in both the outputs that and also in the blog coverage that the research in this field of sexual harassment was growing before Weinstein happened. So if we look at those graphs uh, on the number of books being published or the number of uh, blog postings or the number of articles being published, there's clear evidence that there is a growth of people working in this field from about 2014 to 2017. It already looks like an active area, but without funding. And I think that's, uh, that's quite an interesting um, observation. It's not until Weinstein happens that we start seeing that explosive growth of, of research, the explosive growth of funding as well. The, 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 the genesis, if you like, of a, of a new subtopic of field in this area. And I think it's one of those important things that there are two things to take away from this. That first of all, having a hook um, to, to enable us to make uh, a very concise um, uh, communication messages about a field like Weinstein, like Me Too gave us, means that discourse, conversations, becomes considerably easier. But also, there is an importance here that we need to be ready to talk about it. There is a suggestion there that in the three years, the four years preceding October 2017, the academics, academics are beginning to organize, beginning to discuss, beginning to frame terms of reference, frame conversations in this area that previously they hadn't been doing. And I think that's quite interesting because if, if you go back to thinking about that, the graph of India, where Me Too was just this explosive thing that happened to them in that, in that single phenomenon, and there has no, been no, there appears to be no broader repercussions in terms of Google traffic um, in, in that space. Whereas, you know, in the USA, in the UK, there have been that increase in conversation. So one more thing that I'd like to talk about really is how that research life cycle is framed. Now, as someone who has spent most of their life working in this area, um, I've gotten quite accustomed to this very linear model being presented. So, you know, what normally happens is that you have a linear model put in front of you, and on one side you've got something along the lines of a funder makes a fund available, and then some money goes into a laboratory and there are some test tubes, and then people publish, and then the citations happen. And it's this very linear sort of um, uh, factory-like model of scientific investment and scientific productivity. We have to remember that research is a social phenomenon. It belongs to society. It doesn't sit alongside it. It's not neutral. It has values. It belongs to people. We are trying to resolve issues in society. We are trying to improve human knowledge and the human condition as well as other, other areas. In this research, you can clearly see that there is a, an effect here. We've got a coin phrase, me too. We've got people using it. We have got conversations about sexual harassment being going into the public arena for the first time in considerable number. This has the effect of creating a body of work, a body of academics who are publishing in this area. It means they're applying for grants. It means those grants reference me too, they reference sexual harassment. 
we have more people doing PhDs, more people doing doctorates, more people writing in this area. This comes about from two things, two phenomena. First of all, there is an active body of people who are working in that space already, who are receptive to the needs of society. And secondly, the phenomena itself. And I just want to draw that to the conclusion and say, you know, research, research funding, we, this is answerable to society, society reflects on it. This is a, an interesting mess, a complex network of dependencies, not a, not a single um, command driven economy. So thanks very much. I'm going to hand over the laptop. I'm going to slide it across the table to Suze. We'll take you through the next, next half. That was amazing, Mike. Thank you so much. I love how the science of science is, is so fascinating and reveals so many trends. Uh, so as Josh has already introduced me, hi, I'm Suze. I'm head of public engagement here at Digital Science. My Twitter handle is the ever professional at fun size Zoos, owing to the fact that I'm a nanochemist, literally and professionally, um, and that kind of stuck. <laughs> so if you want to chat about any of the stuff that we cover today, please do get in touch with either Mike, myself, or any of the Altmetric team. Um, so the thing that we're going to be taking you through today is a little bit of gender analysis that we have done on the Altmetric Top 100. So the Altmetric Top 100 is an annual list of research output that has received the most online attention. We have been doing this for a little while now. This is the seventh year that Altmetric have been doing a top 100. So you may have seen some of the blog posts that we've done in the past. We started to look at a bit of gender analysis around this last year. If you haven't seen it, do have a look at our blog post that we wrote up last year. We did think it would be quite an interesting thing for us to maybe start to look at the gender balance that we, we saw last year compare it to what it might be this year and see if we can kind of make any any sense of any potentially meaningful trends that, that we're witnessing as we do this. So what I'll be covering today is gender balance in the Altmetric Top 100 of 2019. I'll briefly touch on the methodology that we used to gather this analysis. I'll do a bit of a comparison between 2018 and 2019, specifically looking at some of the things that we looked at in the previous year and what any of these changes might mean. I'm then going to take a bit of a step back and kind of incorporate some of the work that Mike's been talking about in terms of why we need better representation in research, why we need to engage with a representative sample of society when we talk about research, and also some of the research culture that we're working within and any barriers to inclusion. So that's a bit of an overview of what we'll be covering. So the Altmetric Top 100, let's start off with the methodology. The bulk of this analysis has been done by Dr. Helen Trau. Um, she is the data scientist for digital science consultancy. She's brilliant, she did it last year. A lot of her research actually is based around looking at trends in gender and inequality in research generally. Um, she is absolutely wonderful and you can find some of her work in some of the blog posts that we've published previously on both the Altmetric blog and on the Digital Science blog um, and look up some of her research work as well. She is wonderful. The, the way that we have done this again is to take the 100 top articles that featured in the top 100 and we've run them through a Python gender guesser. So it's a program that analyzes the first names of all of the authors in the top 100. So not just the first authors, but all of the authors, however many there would be on any paper. And it's run through a gender guessing tool. And so what this tool does is it looks at the name and based on previous names that it has seen that are like this or the same as this name, it will assign a gender to it. Um, the Python gender guesser that we used last year is actually different to the one that we use this year. As with all things in research, things develop, things get better. And in this case, we, we realized that there was something available that was going to produce more accurate results. So for the sake of comparing this year's results to last year's results, we have actually run last year's top 100, and by last year's I'm in 2018, through the same gender guesser that we've used this year, just to make that comparison fair. Um, 
it's a brilliant tool uh, and we'll tell you about some of the developments that we noticed in the actual analytical package as we reveal some of the results. So we'll kick off with one of the basics which is the overall gender balance of the altmetric top 100. So in 2018 we saw that of all of the authors in the top 100, 31.6% of them were guessed to be women based on this gender guesser package that was used. Um, interestingly, back in 2018, that was actually a higher percentage of women that were actually working within research overall. Um, so the, the number of women authors in 2018 seemed to already be higher than the number of, than the percentage of women within research. Um, Brilliantly, that's actually improved even more in 2019. So we've gone from 31.6% women to 36.1% of women. So again, we haven't run um, a gender guesser on all of, oh, you know, a kind of representative slice of um, the research demographic in 2019. But it's fair to say it may not have changed hugely drastically since 2018. So I think it's an encouraging trend. But it does make you wonder why this might be. Why is it that more women are featuring in the top 100? Now, this kind of can feed into some stereotypes. I know often people say, well, women are better at communicating. I mean, if I, I don't think there is any kind of gendered um, ability to communicate science. I think it's possibly the fact that women may be encouraged perhaps to do more science communication, or it could be that they naturally fall towards science communication a bit more. Um, there could be many reasons for this. It could just be that a lot of people generally are starting to understand the value of public engagement and of communicating their work a little bit more. So it is an incredibly valuable part of the research cycle. I think Sir Mark Walport famously said that science isn't finished until it's communicated. Um, and that's absolutely true. So it's sort of completing the, the whole research cycle, but it is an interesting thing to look into um, to, to potentially find out why there are so many more women featuring in the top 100 than there are in research overall at the moment. And if that does mean that there are more women in research than there were before, then that's a pretty brilliant thing, I think. It's good to see some of those initiatives hopefully paying off. In terms of an improvement on our gender guesser, what was interesting to see was that the number of names that couldn't be identified, that had an unknown identity, had actually gone down. So this suggests that the gender guesser is becoming more accurate, but it's also probably learning from a wider range of names that it's able to identify the gender of. So these gender guessers are fed a bunch of training information. And depending on the diversity of that training information, it's fed, it can start to learn to, to understand and therefore assign different genders to, to different kinds of names. The limitations that we've seen on some of this technology before is the fact that often foreign names or names in different languages cannot be accurately identified as a, a male name or a female name. And I should say that we're, we're really kind of treating gender as, as binary in this situation. Um, but it's just for the sake of trying to find some meaningful um, analysis within the, the gender balance or imbalance, we should say, within research. Um, so it's encouraging to see that the gender guesser has become more accurate. Fewer unknowns means that the technology that we are using to analyze this is inherently becoming more inclusive, which is kind of what we're hoping all of research will become anyway, which is a, an encouraging sign. If we start to look at the different teams um, that have featured in the top 100, so that if we count each paper as being written by a team of people, this graph shows you how many of those teams were made up just of women. So they were um, papers that were authored exclusively by women. They were teams of mostly women, mostly men, only men, or they had a 50-50 gender balance between them. So if you focus on the women only teams, back in 2018, there were 13% of women only teams. Now that's actually gone down to just 4% in 2019. 
This isn't necessarily discouraging because we do have a, a slight increase in the number of teams that are mostly women. Um, but I think what is interesting is that it could directly be related to the kinds of topics that were covered in the top 100. So back in 2018, there were a lot of articles around health, around well-being, around medicine. And if you look at some of the previous work that we've done in this area, which I can link to later, we had a look at some of the gender balances across the different fields of research. And the life sciences tend to predominantly be better balanced in terms of their um, men to women ratios. So women are still not outnumbering the men in the sciences, but you, you have more women that are involved in that kind of research, especially when compared to things like engineering and physical sciences. Now, it could simply be that some of the fields of research that featured in the Altmetric Top 100 this year actually tended more towards the economic side of things, when we looked at fake news, when we looked at some of the election politics. Um, and it could just be because of that, that there were fewer women-only teams. What is encouraging, however, is that if we look at the number of teams that were equally balanced in terms of men and women. We've gone from 7% in 2018 up to 12% in 2019. So if we look at this through a feminist lens, and by that I mean equality for all, the fact that we are tending towards having maybe more teams that are equally balanced is a brilliant thing. And um, I will cover a little bit about why that is a positive thing and why better representation and more balanced representation is exactly what we need in research a little bit later on. But I think this could directly lead to a bit of an indication on the fields of research that were covered in the Altmetric Top 100. And when we look at team size, this is something that we looked at last year. There weren't very big changes between 2018 and 2019. Some of the smaller teams increased. So by small team, we mean any team that has between two and five people in it. The large team uh, counts as any team that has between six and 19 people in it. And these gigantic teams are teams with 20 or more people. Um, that are authoring these papers. So the number of small teams has gone up ever so slightly. The number of gigantic teams seems to have gone down from 19 gigantic teams to 14. Again, I think this is probably indicative of the fact that there were potentially fewer subjects that were covered in the top 100 of 2019 that featured these huge international collaborations of people. So things like particle physics, or cosmology. These people work in, in huge groups. I mean, some of the papers that come out of CERN, for example, have hundreds, if not thousands, of co-authors on these papers that have all contributed something useful to this research. And so these gigantic teams, again, can tend to feature in certain fields of research more than others. And I think the fact that we had quite a, a different um, focus on the top 100 of, of 2019 is probably reflected in the change in the team sizes, where we had things like the climate crisis covered. We even had the consumption of Lego covered, which uh, I, I did enjoy that paper quite a lot. I'm not saying I took advice from it. You can make your own conclusions up about that. <laughs> one interesting thing was that we did have one paper that was exclusively written by a gigantic team of just men. Um, and it was about the prospective study of tea drinking temperature and the risk of esophageal cancers. Um, I, I don't know. I just like the fact that there's sort of 18 or 19 people sat around working out their methodology or having a nice cup of tea um, in Tehran, I think of all places where they're mostly based. Um, so that was quite an interesting thing, just, just a bit of data that came out of that. Um, so when we talk about some of the gender balances in the different fields of research, I've got a little GIF that's summing up a bit of work that, again, Helen and her team did around this um, and our team covered in terms of interesting stories that come out of the data. So we've created a gender representation tool for UK research institutions and you can dive into this. This is just freely available on our website. We'll provide some links later on. You can jump in and you can search our uh, based on field of research or you can search based on UK institution and it just gives you an idea of the differences in the the gender balance or imbalance 
for all the different fields of research and it really does highlight some of those issues that we had um, in terms of engineering and physical sciences being predominantly male um, and some of the health and life sciences being a little bit more favorable for women. You can have a little read actually about some of the deeper dives we did into this and some of these trends but the reason that I bring this up is because our tea drinking study is based around cancer research and one of the bits of research that we did in our report gender imbalance in cancer research grants looked at some of the trends um, on the number of grants that were funded and also the size of grants that were funded to see whether there was any tie to gender and what they found was that some of the um, first off the number of grants that were awarded to male researchers was much higher than the number of grants awarded to women researchers but in fact the size of those grants was also very different as well where male researchers were being awarded larger grants and more grants than the much smaller fewer grants that women were being awarded um, so where this tea drinking esophageal cancer lies is, is an interesting one because we also found that some of the, the very big, scary, but often rarer cancers were being funded um, for men, but some of the more socially linked cancers, so things like obesity is linked to cancer or smoking is linked to cancer, they were actually being funded um, for, for by women. So there was a real imbalance, even in the types of cancer grant um, that was being awarded and the, the type of research that was being carried out. Um, so I found that quite interesting. So I'd like to see where the tea drinking um, cancer sort of falls into that. The other thing we wanted to look at um, was first authorship of the papers. Now in 2018, the number of first authors in the top 100 that were women were 32.5%. This has gone down to 27.3% in 2019. And this is interesting depending on how you look at it because in some fields of research and in some research groups being a first author on a paper is a sign that you have led the bulk of that research and so it's a real celebration of the fact that you've led that work and it it's sort of seen as as your work in that situation and, and other people helped this isn't the case in all subjects. So when we were looking at this last year, what we discovered was that in some areas of research, for example, computer science, they're already taking one step towards equality and trying to reduce these kind of badges of honor that people wear and making research more of a collaborative effort. So they actually chose to list their authors um, alphabetically. So it didn't matter who had led the research, all of the authors were named alphabetically. So the fact that the number of women first authors has gone down may not necessarily mean that the number of women leading research in the top 100 has gone down. It may be that some of the conventions that we're quite used to seeing in research are changing. Um, so again, it's another one that to kind of look into in a bit more detail. So we can't really conclude a huge amount from that. It is just a reason why we need to dive into research culture a bit more to understand some of these trends. So I'm gonna move on to why we need representation in research. Um, and I will be coming to the Haribo in a moment. Representation is a word that I'm using instead of diversity because diversity I think is often used as a bit of a tick box exercise. And I think representation can maybe make a bit more sense to some people. So if we take um, society to be a packet of Haribo star mix, each one of these different sweets has a different flavor, a different texture, a different shape, a different color, all of these different characteristics. Now, if we are trying to create a tech solution um, for just one of these types of sweets, so if your entire research group was made of cola bottles, for example, and you were making a research solution for people, but all your reference points were, were formed by the shape and the flavor and the size of a cola bottle, then when one of the squishy hearts or a fried egg wanted to try and use this technology solution, they wouldn't be able to because they'll be the wrong kind of texture or they'd just be too wide. If a gummy bear were to try it, maybe they would just fall straight through your tech solution. So if your research group was made up of all of these different kinds of star mix, 
you might have a better chance of being able to identify not just ways that you could help a range of different people, but understand and approach a problem in a range of different ways. Um, now, unfortunately, there are quite a few barriers to involving all the different kinds of star mix into research, which we'll talk about in a moment. The reason that this matters in real life, um, away from Haribo star mixes, are things like this. Um, there are many, many examples in the news of where technology solutions have failed people from a diverse range of backgrounds. For example, this is Mark Martin here, he's from UK Black Tech. We actually did some work with Mark um, on a sickle cell hackathon where we were diving into dimensions data to look at the imbalance of funding for sickle cell research versus um, other diseases that maybe affect sort of the global north or more of the western hemisphere. Um, and that was really interesting as well. But Mark's particular story comes about where he was the victim of a racist soap dispenser. So a tech solution had been created where you didn't have to touch a soap dispenser because it's full of germs. So all you needed to do was wave your hand under a soap dispenser and your hand would spectroscopically be detected under it and soap would be dispensed. Unfortunately, they didn't test this on a range of different skin tones. And so when Mark went to use it, the soap dispenser didn't work. Now, if you try and amplify this problem to other underrepresented groups, for example, if we were to jump back to gender, for as one example, around 50% of the population is made of women. And a lot of drugs that are created are only tested on male subjects. This is a subject that's actually covered really well in Caroline Criado Perez's book, Invisible Women. Lots and lots of research solutions are only tested on male subjects, whether it's medicine, whether it's a car seat belt, which then means that actually women are at higher risk because nobody knows how the shapes of their bodies or the different kind of chemistry is going to um, be impacted by these solutions. And often there can be side effects that just aren't identified until it's too late, until these things are actually on the market. So this is why we need more representative groups. And I am going to use a Disney GIF because I love Disney. So this is from Pocahontas where she sings, you think the only people who are people are the people who look and think like you. But if you walk in the footsteps of a stranger, you'll learn things you never knew you never knew. So that is really important. So we're talking about having more diverse workforces within research, but we're also talking about engaging a wider range of people with the research that's going on so that we can better understand the challenges of people. This is something that digital science have been really keen on for some time. I mean, our motto is to make research more open, more inclusive, more collaborative and more efficient. And we can only really do that by diversifying our workforce and by engaging with a wider range of people um, from the public. So we back in 2018, we ran a panel at Spot on London on gender, uh, on diversity beyond gender. And we spoke to a range of different people um, from minorities in STEM, from pride in STEM, from the neurodiversity um, advocacy group, Quantum Leap Mentoring, and from Kevin Coutinho at UCL, who is a brilliant EDI person um, and works for Windsor Fellows as well. This year, we were speaking to people about open access and accessing research in the global south, how we can better open research up to a range of different people so that we can make research more efficient and the best it can be. So why is it so difficult to do that? Well, there are a bunch of barriers to inclusion within research, and this could be anything from the unconscious bias of a grant funding panel to biases within peer review. There's lots and lots of things that stand in people's ways. There's also a lot of the stuff that Mike was talking about earlier in terms of the culture within research um, and things like harassment and bullying. The Wellcome Trust recently ran a, a survey on research culture and they managed to get responses from people across the globe about how they're feeling about working within research and what the biggest issues are, what's going to push people out of doing research. They published their report um, in, I think it was mid-January, about 15th of January earlier this year, and they put a bunch of their results in this report and also um, a whole host of different figures that you can have a look at and potentially use in your own talks wherever you are, um, which they put on Figshare. So do have a look at that. But the fundamental things were there are a whole bunch of barriers in place, not just 
the things that make your everyday working environment a little bit harder, but literal barriers to getting involved in research and progressing within research. So digital science have, um, they're one of the four founding members of a new research institute called the Research on Research Institute, or RORI. We're working with the Wellcome Trust, we're working with the University of Sheffield, and we're working with the University of Leiden, CWTS, to look at a lot of the work that Mike's been um, touching on in, in his presentation. So the scientometrics is the research on research. We're looking at how effective research is, how efficient it is, and if it's not being as efficient or as productive as it could be, then identifying where the barriers are to making it so. And we are looking at things like culture and decision making and, and how to make research more open, more diverse and more inclusive for the benefit of all, because effectively that is what research is about. It's supposed to help all of mankind, a humankind, I should say. Um, so this is kind of what we're about. We're trying to smash those barriers to inclusion, just like Hulk smashes everything in his path. Um, hopefully, by talking about some of the work that we've been doing, we're able to give you an example of how you can use evidence for these inequalities um, and hopefully some encouraging stats that might help you make cases, whether that is within your own institution, whether it is with your own learned society. We need everybody to make small changes towards positivity. It's not just the job of those people in those underrepresented groups to fight for that. It's everyone's, it's, it's to everyone's benefit to make research the best it can be. And um, so that's all from me. If you want to chat about this or anything else, do you get in touch? There's my Twitter handle, there's Digital Sciences Twitter handle, and I'm going to hand over to Josh now um, to field any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks so much, Susan, Mike. Those are really great uh, presentations. They're really some really insightful stuff. Right, let's see if we've got any questions. More questions? Ah, yes, we have a couple. Uh, okay. Okay, you mentioned earlier that the number of author names the gender tool was unable to identify in the top 100 or metric list has decreased. Is it possible that this is due to a decrease in non-Western names, which are traditionally less recognized by automated gender algorithms? And that comes from Eleanor Rose Pappas. Um, good question, Eleanor. What we noticed when we did our, so the GIF that I, I briefly showed you, which is the visualization tool um, that we created, when we did the bulk of this work last year, um, early last year, we did find when we manually delved into a lot of the data, there was, as you went from arts and humanities towards STEM, you actually had more unknown names. Um, so there were fewer unknowns in the arts and humanities, but there were much more in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Delving in manually, we could see that there was more ethnic diversity within STEM. Um, I certainly hope that we haven't lost a whole bunch of those people um, in the last year, and certainly of the people that, whose research we're talking about. It is entirely possible that the demographics, the kind of ethnic um, demographics, might be quite different this year. We haven't looked into it manually. But um, when we were looking at the Python gender guesser, it does seem to be more inclusive of non-Western names now. And I think it's all down to the training data that these things are being fed, uh, which is why we need, I think, to, to always work to make things like machine learning and AI as um, inclusive as possible so that they can be as useful as possible. Yeah. Ooh, thanks. Thanks, Suze. Thanks very much for the question, Elna. Uh, just give a few seconds for anyone else to ask any questions. Just pop them in the questions box if you do have any questions. Okay, I think that's it. Um, okay, just to wrap up, uh, if you would, uh, if you if you'd like to find out more about all metrics or all metric data and the use of all, metri of all metrics and, and, and the all metric tools and data that we provide. You can find out more on our social channels. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel here with, with uh, lots of great short, shorter videos and uh, recordings of previous webinars we've done, which are 
uh, around all metrics data and their uses. So you can find those all on YouTube and do follow us on our social channels. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you do, if you would like to just ask us a question or uh, you want to find out more about our products or um, and our data, do email our team at info at altmetric.com and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, like I say, we'll try to get a recording of this out uh, in the next uh, day or so. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again. Um, that's all from us. Thank you so thank much, you. Josh. Thanks, thanks for Josh. taking part, everyone. Bye.